Hi everybody, welcome to today's lecture. We have talked a lot already about different regime types and today we're going to briefly consider how political scientists make the biggest differentiation among states between democracy and non-democracy. We want to do this empirically, or in other words, in a scientifically rigorous and transparent manner based upon consistent collection and evaluation of data. Should be easy, right? We have a sense that we intuitively know democracies and non-democracies when we see them. However, this unwritten limitation is not enough for scientific progress, and it can actually be kind of tricky to come up with a consistent set of rules for separating the two. Let's take a brief example to see why it's important to have a consistent set of rules for this purpose. For instance, suppose you would like to find out whether democracy helps lessen economic inequality. In conducting this study, the first thing you will need to do is to identify the states that are democratic and those that are non-democratic. The trouble is that there are many states that will seem to be right on the border between the two, so categorizing them will be different. Even though you think in many cases it's obvious, you still need some rule to determine which is which, as when you present your research to the scientific community, I know when I see it is an unacceptable justification for how you sorted out your states. Obviously, which states you put in the non-democratic and democratic categories will make a huge difference for your results concerning how regime type affects economic inequality. So let's begin our unit on non-democracies by thinking about what they aren't. Democracy. We've already thought about democracy as an ideal type, but that by definition means that it doesn't exist in the real world. How can we identify real-world democracies empirically? Well, there are two basic schools of thought here. The first is democracy is what we will call a dichotomous variable. That is, a state is either a democracy or it isn't, and there is no in-between. The second sees democracy as gradational, or as a degree with many intermediate steps between fully non-democratic and fully democratic. First, let's turn to democracy as a dichotomous variable. Scholars taking this route basically make two categories democracy and non-democracy. The most widely used measure is that by Zhivorsky and his colleagues, and it looks at whether there is real competition and turnover for government offices. Thus, Zhivorsky states, democracy is a system in which parties lose election. And his colleagues, Alvarez et al., state that democracy is a regime in which some government offices are filled as a consequence of contested elections. These political scientists therefore look for evidence that there is real competition, and the key indicator of this is whether there is real turnover and uncertainty. This has been a pretty solid way to go about measuring democracy and non-democracy, but the trick with the dichotomous approach is that any single criterion will have its own shortcomings and tricky cases. Let's take Japan and Mexico as an example. Throughout the second half of the 20th century, they were both ruled by a single party that contested elections. However, experts studying these countries would label Japan as democracy and Mexico as a dictatorship in this period. They argued that the difference was that Japanese elections were truly competitive elections in which the same party just happened to be re-elected. Whereas until late into the 20th century, the PRI utilized corruption, vote buying and election rigging in Mexico, to stay in power. So those elections were not truly competitive. Cases like this can be very tricky for a dichotomous measure to take into account. The alternative is a gradational measure of democracy. Here we can think of democracy as the end point on a continuum from complete dictatorship to complete democracy, with many shades of gray in between. Robert Dahl's famous idea of polyarchy is an example of this, as he identifies many different aspects that go into democracy like civil rights and media freedoms, etc., in addition to free and fair elections. This is in line with the Schmitter and Carr article that we read, in which they note that there are many ways to be differently democratic. As an example, let's think about Freedom House scores. These are probably the most famous ranking of democracy and non-democracy, and they are clearly gradational. They have different dimensions that they rank, such as media, freedom, and civil rights and liberties. And for these categories, they rank countries as being somewhere on a spectrum from negative six, or completely not free, to positive six, or completely free. This is useful because in a way it is more realistic given that democracy is an ideal type that countries can resemble more or less but never actually perfectly achieve. It is also very flexible. Still, it has its disadvantages. First, this is not really as parsimonious or simple as the dichotomous measure. Whereas with a dichotomous measure, we always know what the two categories mean because there is a simple and clear rule. With gradational measures, you can often have states get the same score for very different reasons. If there are 20 criterion that a state is ranked from 0 to 10 on and then the final score is an average, a 7 can mean very different things. This muddies the water when we try to answer questions about the causes and consequences of regime type because it makes it less certain what aspects are doing the heavy call to lifting. A related criticism of these measures is that they often build some of the things we want to study about democracy into the definition of democracy. 
For instance, if social justice and freedom from poverty are included in our definition of democracy, then we can't really answer our question about which regime type is best at combating inequality because we've a priori included it in our very definition of democracy. With the caveats for these contrasting methods in mind, we can conclude this part of the discussion by remembering that democracy, whether measured dichotomously or by degrees, is a positive category premised on the leadership's accountability to the public as exercised by popular selection of the leadership. Though there are many debates about whether to include things above and beyond this definition, democracy remains an identifiable category. This is not the case with authoritarian or non-democratic regimes, which are a residual category. To be a residual category means that it, something is defined more by what it is not than what it is. We define authoritarianism by not being democracy, basically. To think about what a residual category is, let's look at this comedy sketch from Second City. A treat for you Harry Potter fans out there. I'm really brave. I'm a Gryffindor. I'm ambitious. I'm a Slytherin. I'm really smart. I'm a Ravenclaw. I'm a Hufflepuff. You need to say something first? Just say what your thing is. Whatever your house is about. I'm a Hufflepuff. I can't digest lactose. I'm a Hufflepuff. That's not a skill. Who has two thumbs and is a Hufflepuff? I'm a Hufflepuff. Ugh, you can't even tell a joke right. My name is sewn into all of my clothes. All right, so I think we get the message there. So the joke is premised on the Hufflepuffs being a residual category. While the other houses seem to have their own defining traits that sort the students into them, Hufflepuffs are sort of what is left out. This is like authoritarian regime, making it a difficult category to use in empirical studies because of their diversity. Indeed, many non-democracies are as different from one another as they are from democracies, making it very difficult for us to identify the causes and consequences of non-democratic or authoritarian rule in general. There are positive types within this category. Indeed, there are all too many of them, and those that we see listed here are just a tiny subsample of the categories that scholars have offered. It is important to peel back the surface of authoritarianism to deal with this residual category's diversity when trying to evaluate theories. For instance, let's go back to our earlier question. What is the effect of regime type on economic inequality? For a moment, let's set aside how diverse a group democracies are and how they deal with socioeconomic inequality. We'll get to that in a few units. Here we're pitting democracy against all non-democracies, but let's think about this for a second. Are all non-democracies similar in how they treat economic inequality? No. Many non-democracies will do pretty bad when it comes to inequality. Some of these regimes are content to have huge swaths of the population suffer in poverty while the privileged few live like ballers. But then again, some authoritarian regimes are communist, which means that they try to increase equality at all costs. Indeed, the reason these regimes are non-democratic is because they limit personal liberty in an effort to provide equality for all. Thus, in comparison to democracies, some non-democracies will do better on equality, and some will do worse. Finally, to conclude today's lecture, let's think of one further challenge in studying authoritarian regimes. In addition to the diversity, which makes studying them as a whole so difficult, it is often very difficult to study them because in many authoritarian regimes, the leadership is not too keen on having scholars poke around and asking sensitive questions. For example, let's suppose you're a researcher who is very interested in what the Chinese public thinks about environmental problems and who they blame for their environmental problems. The obvious thing to do would be to conduct a big survey, but if you end up concluding that the government has not done all it can in regards to the environment, your study might not get anywhere. Moreover, the authorities will likely be very wary of letting you back into the country. And this is particularly true of Western scholars who tend to start from a normative point of view that democracy is better than non-democracy, and therefore they inject this pro-democracy stance into their research that can obviously be very off-putting for non-democratic regimes. Of course, it's not really true that you can just go around and ask any question you want concerning the U.S. government or other governments in democratic countries either, but there is definitely a large difference of degree in what you can and cannot study between democracies and many non-democracies. Well, on that note, we end today's lecture. We'll think more about the internal goings on in authoritarian regimes next time. For now, have a great day.